Good day. Since we've now completed arterial blood gas and physiologic properties of ventilation and oxygenation, we are now going to begin with the basics of non-invasive ventilation. Just one thing I'd like to remind you is on your blood gas test, you had some categories that you answered, oxygenation, ventilation, etc. And under oxygenation, you now need to go back and actually fulfill oxygenation as the P to F ratio or the oxygenation index because oxygenation is never, yes, I'm oxygenated or no, I'm not. And that's, of course, what the answer was on all of the blood gas tests. So now we're going to talk about strategically applying methodologies of ventilator support for our patients, either non-invasively or invasively. I will not be talking here about nasal cannula, non-rebreather, high flow oxygen, because those are strategies that are really actually about the partial pressure of oxygen delivered to the patient the FiO2 of the atmospheric pressure, as we've discussed before. So those are relatively simple strategies that do not have a significant amount of actual ventilatory support. With non-invasive and invasive ventilation, we're actually going to cause changes in the lung with our methodology of flow of gas to an endpoint of pressure or volume. And so as we begin, non-invasive ventilation. What I want you to know is I'm going to talk about continuous pressure, inspiratory pressure, expiratory pressure, and those are all related to flow of gas to an endpoint or measurement of pressure. So to begin with basics of non-invasive ventilation. Whenever we're at the bedside, our number one question will be, is this patient appropriately oxygenated? So one of the things to remember is the P to F ratio, as we've discussed before, is an excellent way of evaluating oxygenation. Unfortunately, actual true P to F requires intubation, but we can have a strategic evaluation of whether or not our patient is appropriately oxygenated with the caveat. We did a P to F, but the patient isn't intubated. All that's going to do is tell us is the FiO2 I gave the patient actually getting to the alveoli for gas exchange. So number one, is our patient appropriately oxygenated? P to F, OI, other strategies, the AA gradient to apply to actually determine whether the oxygen you're giving the patient actually gets into the blood. And number two, is my patient removing carbon dioxide? So that's pretty straightforward. I'm measuring a PaCO2. I'm measuring an end tidal CO2. And if I want to look at whether or not I'm perfusing the lung, I would add categorically a PVCO2 because that's going to give me a lot of good information. Are the lungs compliant? Remember, compliance of the lung is about distendability of the alveoli. So I can have a basic evaluation by looking at the lung field on a chest x-ray, but what I really have to know is whether or not positive pressure that I'm applying is opening up the lung and improving oxygenation. That gives us a strategy of understanding. And then, not for this lecture, but did we overburden the right heart? Now remember, we can overburden the right heart and consequentially the left heart when we're applying a very high level of positive pressure into the pulmonary vault. But it's not commonly seen with non-invasive ventilation. In fact, with non-invasive ventilation, we may unburden the left heart and improve blood flow dynamics. Now, all these points are critical, and our patients are critical as well. And that's why when we go to the bedside, we have to ask at least the first three questions and always consider the fourth. Is my patient oxygenated? Is he removing CO2? Are his lungs compliant? And is the right heart overburdened? So, the definition for non-invasive ventilation means that I have mechanical ventilatory support. So that's different than just oxygenation support. Mechanical ventilation support with gas flow to a pressure using techniques that do not require intubation or tracheostomy. So that's really important. Non-invasive ventilation gives us very similar strategies that we use when we intubate patients, but we can do this without intubation. Now, why do we want to do that? Well, first of all, intubating a patient causes tremendous trauma. It can cause lacerations, 
hemorrhage. It leaves your airway defenses disintact. And so patients are very at risk for pneumonia, pneumonitis, sinusitis, and for happy with intubation. So non-invasive ventilation avoids that upper airway trauma. It leaves your airway defenses intact. It's more comfortable for the patient because there isn't now a tube through the vocal cords into the trachea, which is hyperstimulating and one of the reasons that patients get so agitated. It allows your patient to talk with whatever interface they have. And they are also able to remove the interface if it's a full face mask or a helmet to eat. And because we haven't placed a tube through the trachea, the patient is going to be less anxious. As long as he accommodates the ventilatory support, he's going to be less anxious and he's going to require much, much less sedation. There's lower mortality and morbidity and cost associated with non-invasive ventilation. But the biggest caveat, and there really are two, the first one is the patient must be able to protect his airway and he must actually be compliant. He must be comfortable with that ventilatory strategy in order for it to work appropriately. So we think about those advantages, some of which we've already talked about, but now let's think about a little bit more physiologic advantage, right? If we intubate a patient, it's just like if I held my nose and used a straw with my lips tightly pursed, how hard it is to move gas through that narrow little straw. Well, that's called resistance work. It increases the resistance uh, to the flow of gas. Now remember, you see that? You can see that at, at the bedside with the peak inspiratory pressure of the ventilator because now the pressure is higher to overcome that resistance work. Now most of our um, modern ventilators have an application that overcomes that resistive work of the endotracheal tube. However, it is really important to appreciate that this is a normal breathing pattern, except now I'm not breathing with negative intrathoracic pressure, I'm breathing with positive intrathoracic pressure, which means it makes it much easier to flow gas in and out of the lung. And of course, those complications, as we mentioned before, early complications of intubation, local trauma, edema, stimulation of the gag reflex, and aspiration, and then later complications of intubation, which are injury to the hypopharynx and the larynx and the trachea and the direct opening into the lung promoting nosocomial infections, more commonly known for us, of course, as healthcare-induced injuries, right? Happies, or not a pressure injury, but a, a ventilation injury. Okay, again, much less costy, costly for our system. Now, there are some significant disadvantages, okay? With non-invasive ventilation, it's going to take a lot more time to correct gas exchange abnormalities to help remove CO2 and to help better oxygenate the patient. Typically, with intubation ventilation, we see that occur pretty rapidly because we've taken over the methodology of breathing. With non-invasive ventilation, it's going to take a little more time to correct those gas exchange abnormalities. So that means there's a, a lot more... Uh, patients in the initial time commitment. But the other aspect of initial time commitment is I, I do a short-term paralysis and sedation, intubate the patient, and that's the initial time commitment. Then we see how they respond to our ventilatory strategy. Here, because that's not what you're going to do, it's going to take some time, a lot of patience and support when you are actually encouraging your patient to breathe naturally, become zen with their non-invasive ventilation, don't threaten the patient. If you don't do this, we'll have to intubate you. That's a big threat. It would make me anxious if you said that to me. And I understand all of this. Just, it's okay. It might feel like it's hard for you to breathe. Just try to relax. I'm here with you. Everything's okay. It takes an initial time commitment of the nurse and the respiratory therapist. So whenever you apply non-invasive ventilation, you're probably going to need 30 to 45 minutes at the bedside to work with that patient. If we are using a facial mask, and really any mask, there's always the possibility for leakage of air, and that's positive pressure air, around the mask seal, whether it's a nasal mask or a whole face mask. That air leakage in particular 
can irritate the eyes and cause very, very profound dry eye, redness of the eye. It can actually end up causing some damage. So we have to be very aware of that. We also have to be aware of something that I think all of us are seeing now. In our days now, we wear an N95 all day long if we're on a COVID unit, and at the end of the day, we have marks on our cheek, we have redness around our nose. Some of us have skin breakdown. Well, that's the same kind of thing that happens with the mask that's being placed for non-invasive ventilation because it's a continuous mask and it's applied relatively tightly in order to protect from air leakage. So facial skin necrosis, the most common complication. It's also why one must be well trained for application of the mask, whether it's nasal or facial. We don't use helmets here at Grady, so nasal or facial mask. You must be aware of how much leak is acceptable and what kind of a leak is actually deleterious because you don't want to make this so tight that as soon as you've applied it, it's cutting into the skin and it's also going to cause discomfort for your patient. The other thing that's really important is to remind ourselves that if we take a mask off in order to wash the face, give some relief, allow for eating, that the patient's oxygen may drop. And so typically, if we're going to take the mask off for you to eat, if it's a full facial mask and we're going to take it off for you to eat, we're going to apply some other form of supplemental oxygen. But if the mask gets taken off accidentally or you remove it accidentally and without any other awareness or support, the patient can have a transient hypoxemia. It also could be a sustained hypoxemia. And last but not least, lack of airway access and airway protection. So again, your patient's going to be at risk for aspiration and it's going to be very difficult for us to do good suctioning in the deep airway, deep suctioning, to actually help remove the secretions. We're going to need our patient to actually be a partner here to cough and spit and cough and spit. Now let's apply the differences between non-invasive positive pressure ventilation and invasive positive pressure ventilation. So I'm going to go back between NIV, NPPV, NIPPV, but it's all the same. If you've got an N in front of it, it means non-invasive. Okay? So remember the advantages. Allows our patient to maintain many normal functions, to speak, to eat, to cough, to spit. It helps avoid the risk and complications that are associated with intubation, all the edema that may occur, the introduction into the lung for the possibility of nosocomial infection. It also allows us to reduce the amount of sedation required. Typically, we don't put these patients on continuous sedation. And if they are receiving continuous sedation, it will typically be with Presidex or dexamethamidine which is an alpha antagonist. It's not a benzodiazepine, so it doesn't suppress the respiratory drive. And of course, the most beautiful part of non-invasive ventilation is that there's less, significantly less, ventilator-associated pneumonia. But there are some disadvantages. So first is that it doesn't protect your patient against aspiration. And they're not going to tolerate nearly as much airway pressure. Remember, with intubation and positive pressure breathing, we tolerate a peak pressure of around 40. We typically don't like to see a peak pressure or an inspiratory pressure with non-invasive ventilation greater than 15 to 20. We don't really like to see more than that. If it's more than that, it really requires an uh, endotracheal tube. And then, of course, remember, no access to the airway uh, for suctioning. And last but certainly not least, you may have a severely agitated patient and they may get very agitated with the placement of this mask because they feel like they are being smothered because it's positive pressure against them at all times. Okay, so lots and lots and lots of indications. I'm sorry for the run on word here. Acute pulmonary edema or immunocompromised patients, postoperative patients, patients with ARDS, patients with pneumonia, trauma, burns, restricted thoracic disorders, patients who don't wish to be intubated, who say, do not intubate me, but they need support. And also we can give it to give some support to patients during bronchoscopy. So quite important for us to appreciate that uh, the phenotype of lung dysfunction that we see in COVID-19, we see one phenotype with a compliant lung that is particularly responsive to oxygen, 
those patients may go from high, high um, nasal cannula at seven to eight liters a minute to high flow oxygen to BiPAP, whereas patients who have phenotype H have lost lung compliance. Those patients who have lost lung compliance will require intubation and alveolar recruitment because their lung is completely non-compliant and the amount of support you can give them non-invasively does not actually significantly and profoundly affect the compliance of the lung. Okay, lots of exclusion criteria. Patients post-respiratory arrest. Patients who needed an immediate intubation because they've stopped breathing. Patients who are profoundly unstable hemodynamically. If they cannot protect their airway, they can't cough and they can't swallow. If they have a severe excess of secretions, so they aren't really able to manage their secretions well when you have a non-invasive ventilatory support. If they're profoundly agitated or confused. If they have facial deformities or surgeries that prevent the mask from fitting. If they are not cooperative or not motivated. And what I would always remind you is if you put on a facial mask and what their, uh, their facial structure uh, is a failure for a facial mask, that's the time to consider a nasal mask if possible. Uncooperative, unmotivated, brain injured patients with unstable respiratory drives, untreated pneumothorax, which can of course get much bigger in non-invasive ventilatory support, severe upper GI bleeds, or severe encephalopathy. These are exclusion criteria. Those patients really need to be intubated. So let's think about the mechanism of action here. The mechanism of action with non-invasive ventilation, number one, is that it reduces diaphragmatic requirements, it reduces inspiratory muscle work, and therefore reduces the blood flow and oxygen needs of those muscles in order for them to perform. That means that we're going to rest those muscles. We're still going to give you good breathing, but we've rested your respiratory muscles. It also allows us to increase your tidal volume. Now CPAP is a continuous positive pressure that maintains alveolar opening and reduces the inspiratory work that's required. If we add inspiratory pressure support, IPAP, that now gives us BiPAP, if we add IPAP, that overcomes your air, airway resistance and your alveolar resistance. And so the difference is CPAP is constant pressure that just reduces the work promotes alveolar distension, promotes oxygenation. IPAP reduces airway resistance and alveolar resistance, but it also provides a differential that will then relate to tidal volume. So we'll be able to increase your tidal volume with, with BiPAP in particular. Non-invasive ventilation actually ultimately improves compliance of the airway system. And it does that by reversing the microatelectasis or the collapse of the alveoli. It can also enhance cardiovascular function by reducing the afterload to the left ventricle. So really, really important for us to remember that as we apply it at the bedside, it may actually improve your blood flow dynamics, may improve your LV stroke volume. Okay. So now we take a look at a little cartoon, and this little cartoon is meant to show you a respiratory function test. So with the respiratory function test, we breathe in, we breathe out, we breathe in, we breathe out. That, of course, is our tidal volume. We breathe in, we breathe out, we breathe in, 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 taking as much air in as we possibly can. That's known as inspiratory reserve volume. And then we think about we breathe in, we breathe out, we breathe in, we breathe out. So we have an inspiratory tidal volume, an expiratory tidal volume, inspiratory tidal volume, expiratory tidal volume. And then breathe out, 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 out. That's our expiratory reserve volume. The amount of gas we can force out of our lung, often called FEV, forced expiratory volume, and you have it in two components. But in the end, there's always a residual volume if you have functional lungs. Residual volume is what keeps your alveoli open. And that, of course, is what we want to increase. When we give patients PEEP, when we give them CPAP, or if we call it EPAP, what we're actually doing is increasing the expiratory reserve volume and the residual volume. And that actually increases what we know as functional residual 
capacity. What is functional residual capacity? At the end of a normal exhaled breath, the amount of gas that stays in the lung. So if I have more gas in your lung at the end of your normal expiration, more alveoli are kept open. Really straightforward. And then when we think about tidal volume, we talk about tidal volume is affected by our pressure support, by our pressure control, by tidal volume adjustments, and by also what we call inspiratory pressure, uh, inspiratory airway pressure. Okay, so that's basically pressure support, only administered non-invasively. So I affect tidal volume with pressure support, pressure control, uh, tidal volume ventilation, and IPAP. That affects our tidal volume. So that's going to affect more significantly our CO2 and our CO2 removal. PEEP, CPAP, EPAP will improve our functional residual capacity. And when we talk about invasive ventilation, we'll also talk about pressure control over a longer period of time, which actually improves alveolar opening as well. Okay, very good. So, modalities of non-invasive ventilatory support. CPAP, one pressure constantly. That CPAP improves oxygenation by recruiting collapsed alveoli and by promoting airflow, that's what it is, it's a gas flow, constantly rich with oxygen and low CO2. So I'm refreshing the gas in the alveoli with oxygenated gas that's continuously applied. It's one pressure only. BiPAP, also known as bi uh, bi-level, and I don't want you to confuse bi-level non-invasively with bi-level ventilation through an endotracheal tube. Those can be two different things. But bi-level non-invasively is the application of two pressures. It's a boost of pressure that occurs every time the patient makes an effort to take a breath. Okay, so there's two types of pressures. EPAP, expiratory pressure, also like CPAP or PEEP, the same kind of thing. And then IPAP, which is the turning on of gas flow whenever the patient makes an inspiratory effort or whenever there's a change in time cycling. So very important. IPAP supports inspiration and it actually improves tidal volume, thus improving CO2. EPAP helps recruit more alveoli and that improves oxygenation. So BiPAP has two different pressures. The continuous constant and expiratory pressure known as EPAP and the intermittent inspiratory pressure. And the difference between the two, the bigger the difference, the bigger the tidal volume. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use EPAP and FiO2, this one down here, to promote better oxygenation. And I'm going to use IPAP to promote reduction in respiratory work and a reduction in your PaCO2. Pretty gorgeous. And I'm going to do that through a facial mask, a nasal mask, or if I'm lucky, lucky through a hood. But here at Grady, we typically use a full facial mask. And in extraordinary situations, we'll apply a nasal mask. And I want to make sure you appreciate that these modalities require a significant amount of nurse and respiratory therapy monitoring, time, patience, explanation. Okay, so let's look at CPAP. Continuous positive airway pressure, an application of a constant pressure throughout the spontaneous cycle. My patient's taking his own breaths, his own tidal volumes are going to be very dependent with every breath he takes. There's no inspiratory assist. It is only an exhalation pressure. Although it maintains constantly through both exhalation and inspiration, it doesn't change. So it has the same basic physiologic effects as PEEP does. So if you look at this diagram on the bottom, this is a patient who has no uh, true expiratory pressure. And then you look on the top one and your patient has more, I think is, it's hard for me to see it exactly. No, I'm sorry. The one on the top is your normal inspiration. At zero, you must generate negative inspiratory force through the work of your diaphragm to move gas in. So that's a lot of respiratory work. And on the bottom, we're starting here with the pressure of around three, the uh, end expiratory pressure or the CPAP. And so the patient has to do much less work to move gas in and it becomes much easier for the patient to breathe because I've opened his airways and I've opened his alveoli so now we can just go ah, 
instead of <gasps> getting that breath down in there. CPAP is a pneumatic splint. It's a pneumatic splint for the upper airway. It prevents soft tissue to, to, uh, from narrowing and collapsing and it improves alveolar opening. So remember, normal breath in a critical patient, it's like <sighs> trying to get that gas down to the alveoli. But when I apply CPAP, it becomes <gasps> oh, oh, much less work to move in and out. That's because CPAP improves lung compliance, opens collapsed alveoli, improves oxygenation, and it decreases the amount of work you have to produce to move gas in and out of the lung. And remember, it can also decrease the left ventricular, what we call the transmural pressure, the pressure across the walls, so therefore it reduces the tension development and can improve cardiac output. And remember for us, if we're looking at the arterial line, we can actually see stroke volume, which will be fabulous for us when we're monitoring our patients. Okay, so again, CPAP, and you can see here, we have a patient who has 10 of CPAP. He makes a small effort to pull air in, but it's much easier to move air in and out because he starts at a positive pressure. Now that positive pressure is in addition to the atmospheric pressure. So if we just say simply, atmospheric pressure, 760. I think here, here in Atlanta, it's around 748, maybe 750. So we're, we're actually saying that at rest, your lungs and the atmosphere are equal, and we call that zero. Now this is your atmosphere, and here's your lungs. Now if I've added 10 of pressure to open the lung, I can move gas in and out with much less work because I don't have to overcome all that resistance. Whereas if my pressure in my lung is lower, this being my lung, pressure in my lung being lower than the atmosphere, I have to work much harder to move gas in and out. I have to generate a much higher pressure. So remember I start at zero, now I gotta work, 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 work to pull that gas in. Whereas if I start a little above zero, I have to work very, very gently to move gas in and out. CPAP decreases the resistance that must be overcome. It decreases the work that must be done by your muscles and your diaphragm. Therefore, it can help preserve blood flow because I don't need as much blood flow to muscles that aren't working as hard because they don't require quite as much oxygen. So we, we believe in general, the functional goal of CPAP is to reduce work of breathing. And it's a beautiful form of support to evaluate whether or not patients are ready for extubation. Although in today's world, we typically do more BiPAP than we do CPAP to determine whether or not patients are ready for extubation, but you can just use CPAP. It's a CPAP trial. Okay. BiPAP is also a spontaneous breathing modality, but it also gives support to the breathing. So remember, you have an expiratory pressure, which is the constant pressure that remains keeping your alveoli and airways open. And then as soon as the patient makes an ins uh, inspiratory effort, the flow from the ventilator console turns on and gas flows to an inspiratory pressure. So, continuous pressure keeping me open, and as soon as I make an effort, <gasps> flow turns on to a predetermined inspiratory pressure, and the difference between the two, inspiratory pressure and expiratory pressure, the difference between the two determines your tidal volume. So, we can, we can set our level of pressure. That's the limit of inspiration is the level of pressure. Flow gas, flow gas, flow gas till we reach a pressure. Once we reach that pressure, the vent cycles off. Okay, so then the machine switches back to EPAP. Now it switches back to EPAP in, in two categories. One is the patient was making an effort, <gasps> flow gas in, and they're no longer making an effort, that inspiratory flow turns off, and now we begin the expiratory pressure or if it's time cycled. I set a certain amount of time allowed for inspiration, so if it's 12 breaths per minute, uh, 12 breaths per minute is five second cycle, so inspiration is typically around two of that and expiration is around three of that. So that's really important if I set an inspiratory time. An inspiratory time means the amount of time the gas is gonna flow in to reach that pressure and to actually mobilize and maintain a tidal volume. Okay. So 
very important to think about BiPAP, spontaneous BiPAP. Tidal volume will vary breath to breath and it's determined by lung compliance, the preset inspiratory pressure limit, which is what determines the flow of gas, and IPAP must always, always be higher than EPAP. And the minimum of difference, so if I've set your EPAP, which in other lives you would have called CPAP or PEEP, but not with, not with BiPAP, EPAP, that E pressure, let's say we set it at eight, we can't set inspiratory pressure at 10, that's only a difference of two. So typically what we're gonna do is start with the difference of around five. So if I have an EPAP of five, I'm gonna set an IPAP of 10 with the difference of five, that's what's going to determine the amount of pressure support, the flow of gas that occurs when my patient makes an inspiratory effort. Now, that spontaneous mode actually depends on the patient effort to trigger, trigger the inhalation. But I can also set a rate which will also facilitate breaths, okay? So BiPAP is continuous positive inspiratory pressure intermittently interrupted, I'm sorry, continuous positive expiratory pressure intermittently interrupted by inspiratory pressure. So it's continuous flow of gas to a predetermined pressure, EPAP, and then based on a time cycle or based on my patient's inspiratory effort, an intermittent inspiratory pressure, which is an increased flow of gas to a predetermined pressure. BiPAP. We love it. It's a spontaneous and timed mode. We call it ST. Spontaneous and timed. There's a certain interval. So I might set a respiratory rate of five. And if my patient isn't breathing five times a minute, then they'll have an IPAP generation. Okay? So if you were, let's say, I have to do this easier so it'll be easy for me mathematically. I set the absolute mandatory rate at six. That means at 10 seconds, if my patient hasn't spontaneously instrumented flow, at 10 seconds, the vent will turn on with an inspiratory flow. So this is called your backup rate, your backup rate. Now, if I set a backup rate of six and my patient is breathing 22 times a minute, that's gonna be time to the patient's own breath and it won't be turned on in a mandatory way. So this is really, really important because I can set a backup rate with BiPAP and assure that my patient gets a certain amount of breaths. Now, obviously, if the patient isn't triggering the vent, this is a concern in a non-invasive modality, but at least I have a backup apnea rate or a backup rate that I can set for my patient. Okay, beautiful. Now, let's take a look at BiPAP. So what you're seeing here is this remarkable little cartoon drawing that just reminds us that EPAP is set at a constant level, IPAP is set at a constant level, and here what you're seeing is EPAP is five and IPAP is 10. So we meet the criteria of a five centimeter difference. Perfect, okay? Now, let's remind ourselves that what we're looking at is this shift from EPAP to IPAP reduces the diaphragmatic and muscle work, it alleviates shortness of breath, and because it propagates the tidal volume, we're gonna have better removal of CO2, okay? I want you to remind yourself, IPAP is set to shortness of breath and CO2. EPAP is set to oxygenation. So that's why we have to understand oxygenation as well as CO2. So we know what to set with our BiPAP ventilator. So that when we're seeing that our patient is still very short of breath, we're calling our colleagues, respiratory therapy and the physician, to recommend that we have a small increase in IPAP in order to try to alleviate shortness of breath and improve CO2 removal. So this is basically what you're looking at with the BiPAP or pressure support. Your patient's at a constant pressure he makes an inspiratory effort, inspiratory flow turns on to a pressure, and that actually shows us what's occurring for the patient. Now this is really what we look at all with a ventilator, but it's very uh, applicable here. So now look below and you see flow rate. Flow rate is constant, and then it increases during inspiration, and then it lets off and goes below, the flow turns off, and what we see is exhalation begins. Inspiration flow goes up, exhalation flow goes down. Inspiration flow goes up, 
exhalation flow goes down. Beautiful. And remember, that constant pressure or that EPAP is an oxygenation determinant and the IPAP is going to affect the rate of breathing and the CO2 clearance through the manipulation of the tidal volume. Okay, so why do we start on non-invasive ventilation and how do we do it? Well, first of all, we're not going to start without having all types of adequate monitoring in place. So very significant uh, evaluation of vital signs, not Q4 hours, but it's going to be every hour when we start. Patient needs to be on cardiac monitoring and pulse oximetry. So wherever they find themselves, they need those three components. We need to uh, evaluate them clinically with clinical examinations, assuring that they're comfortable, that they still have functional mental status, that the work of breathing is going down, and that they're able to handle their mucus and their secretions. And ABGs are a very useful tool that help us to evaluate and assess the adequacy of treatment. Okay. So once the decision's been made to initiate non-invasive ventilation, first we should choose what we're going to do. We're going to use CPAP if the main problem is hypoxemia. We're going to favor BiPAP if the main problem is hypercorvia. And we'll also consider BiPAP for both. So if you're both hypoxemic and hypercorbic, or there's concern that if we treat the hypoxemia, there may be some other issues that occur, we're going to put you on BiPAP. If we're using a nasal mask or a full face mask, so remember here at Grady, we start with a full face mask. We're going to hold that mask in place without securing it. Turn on the ventilator and actually encourage the patient to be synchronous. So we're going to turn it on and hold the mask in place without securing it. Once the patient actually achieves a comfort level and we perceive that there's little leak, we will now secure the mask with straps and we'll avoid a tight fit. Remember that with BiPAP, an increase in IPAP will predominantly affect the PCO2, and an increase in EPAP will predominantly affect the PO2. But if I increase the EPAP without increasing the IPAP, so in other words, if I started at 5 with EPAP and 10 of IPAP, okay, and then I said he still isn't well oxygenated, I'm going to increase his EPAP, I'm going to narrow the difference between the two, which means it's going to decrease the tidal volume. So now I'm going to have to pay attention to be sure that I haven't caused an increase in CO2 retention that is related to the reduction in the tidal volume. So one really, really important thing to remember at every attitude change is that the inspiratory component should always be higher than the expiratory, right? IPAP should always be higher than EPAP. And optimally, it's at least five higher. So if I go up on EPAP, I should also go up on IPAP, okay? The FiO2 is also titrated to actually improve oxygenation. And again, remember that some patients are profoundly oxygen responsive. So turning up the FiO2 may be helpful, at least in the beginning until we get our alveolar recruitment functional, and then we can start to reduce the FiO2. Okay, so initial NIV parameters always supply, uh, apply a pressure support of five centimeters for CPAP always give CPAP at least five. If we're starting with BiPAP, we can do our EPAP support at three to five centimeters. And then you can see here, if you start at three, your IPAP must be eight. If you start at five, your IPAP must be 10. You must always have a difference of five. Now, we're gonna increase these parameters uh, typically by two centimeters water pressure at a time until our exhale tidal volume, not our inspired tidal volume, our exhale tidal volume is 10 to 15 mLs per kilogram. And we see that shortness of breath, dyspnea, and increased work of breathing starts to fall. So we want to see that respiratory rate fall below 25 times per minute. That alleviates their shortness of breath. It decreases the respiratory rate. They have an increased tidal volume. And now they're going to feel more comfortable and they're going to have patient ventilator synchrony. You've got to assure all of those things when you start patients on uh, non-invasive ventilation. And you're going to give, typically you're going to look at two hours, you're going to look again at four hours, you're going to look again at six hours. 
In some institutions, they say four hours is the cutoff point. Things aren't better. We've got to intubate. Other institutions, they say six hours is the cutoff point. Hard stop. Patient isn't better. We have to intubate. It all depends on your team. Depends on the respiratory therapist. Everybody should have a discussion about this at the initiation of non-invasive ventilation. How long are we going to allow this to continue before we see an improvement? And if our patient gets agitated and confused, how quickly are we going to intervene by intubation? That's a really important understanding in non-invasive ventilation. Okay, then we think about our methodologies of application. So for us, primarily here at Grady, we use facial mask or we can use a nasal mask. Okay, so very important to appreciate that if you're going to apply a nasal mask, your patient's got to keep their mouth closed. And typically, people, when they fall asleep, their mouth drops open. They're going to have a significant leak of pressure from the mouth. That's not going to actually perform what you're trying to do. So in general, number one, in general, let's remember that we normally here at Grady will start with a face mask. You can get a tight seal. It's a tight seal. A tight seal. That advantage is a really good seal. There are disadvantages because now your patient is receiving that positive pressure. They have no escape. It stimulates, it can stimulate regurgitation, it can cause aspiration. It makes the patient less comfortable in the beginning because they're like, oh my God, I can't breathe. They feel like they're asphyxiating. Regurgitation aspiration is so important, I put it up there twice, okay? And you must pay a lot of attention to your alarms and your monitors when you have patients on a face mask. You need to do that all the time. Now, if you can't apply a face mask because of the structure of the patient's face or because they have some other facial deformities or you just you can't achieve an appropriate mask placement, you can't get the right size, you need to put on a nasal pillow or a nasal mask. Now, this is much more comfortable. Patient can eat with this on and the patient is more compliant with this interaction. But remember, there's lots of leak and this can cause a pretty significant nasal dryness and also nasal discharge. Let's remember that we're not typically going to go above 20 centimeters of water pressure as a support mode here. Now, I love to put this picture up. Uh, I like to put this picture up because this is a patient I took care of uh, in Haiti. This was a patient who wasn't even our little Haitian ICU. We had a five-bed ICU. It was, you know, a mock ICU during the crisis. And this, at this time, we were during the cholera crisis. But this was one of my patients that was in what we called a med surge area. And you can see it was med surge bed two, right? Med surge bed four is another bed space. But she's in med, uh, med, med surge spot two. I had been very lucky to achieve two non-invasive ventilators. They were old. They were not being used anymore. They'd been refurbished with a commitment to disposables for five years. So I actually flew to Haiti with two non-invasive ventilators and uh, boxes of 100 circuits. I was very fortunate. I'll give a call out, shout out to Delta here, who did not charge me for the excessive amount of things that I was bringing to Haiti. Clothes, supplies, ventilators, monitors, on my trips there. And this patient was one of my patients who had very severe shortness of breath and she just felt like she couldn't breathe. Now it was very difficult for us to perform blood gases, but I was able to look at her pulse ox. Pulse ox was poor. I couldn't really look at her CO2. So I said, let's just strategize. We'll work with this non-invasive ventilator. And it's an old respironics ventilator. And it's very complex for setup, but I had reviewed it with the rep prior to leaving for Haiti. I applied the facial mask on the patient uh, and was able to achieve a pretty good placement with very little leak. And as soon as I put her on it, she was like all sweaty and she always looked mad and unhappy. But within an hour, I, I, I was evaluating her and I came back and I said, Mrs. S, how are you? She says, I'm so much better. And you wouldn't have known it when you looked at her. She just looked like she was mad and she was kind of sweaty. Of course, it's hot in Haiti and we didn't have air conditioning. We didn't have any air circulation at all. And honestly, it saved her life. Non-invasive ventilation is fabulous. And if we understand the basic strategies, FiO2, rate, EPAP, IPAP, one of the things I always tell people is don't let knobs and buttons get in your way. Understand the strategies. Understand your strategies. EPAP, constant pressure opening the alveoli. IPAP, the flow of gas to achieve a certain pressure which will open the airways and the alveoli and promotes 
your tidal volume and CO2 removal. And the way you evaluate this is by reduction in shortness of breath and improvement in the objective evaluation of the patient and the subjective statements of the patient telling you they feel better. If they get more agitated, they get confused, it's not working. Cool? I think it's pretty cool. And I sure was fortunate to have these non-invasive ventilators. They're still using them at the uh, Project MediShare Hospital uh, in, in Haiti now. Okay, so let's talk about a protocol, all right? So we have to be sure that we're in a location where we can appropriately monitor the patient. We need to sit the patient in the bed or in a chair, and they must be at at least 30 degree angle. A full face mask should be used for the first 24 hours. Then you may be able to switch to a nasal mask if the patient prefers it. At Grady, typically we only give nasal mask if we cannot get a tight seal with a full face mask. We often, when we start, we encourage our patient to hold the mask tight to their face. And we apply that harness and we avoid excessive strap tension. You don't need to meld it into the skin for it to work. We connect the interface to the ventilator tubing, we turn on the ventilator, we check for air leaks, we readjust straps as needed. We consider very, very mild sedations. We can use lorazepam or midazolam or Presidex continuously in agitated patients. Lots of encouragement, lots of reassurance, frequent checks and adjustments as needed, and we monitor the blood gas after the first hour to two and then as needed. If I have not achieved improvement at two hours, I need to make a change and then monitor the blood gas again in another two hours. Improvements are actually expected within two hours and first two hours, I should see an improvement. If I don't see an improvement, I'm gonna adjust my settings and the second two hours, I should see an improvement. And those first segments, that first two hours and the second two hours, that actually predicts the eventual success. If I can't improve the impatient by four hours, I should start considering intubation. And rather than have it be a crash intubation, it should be an elective intubation. Okay, so troubleshooting with interfaces is just a checklist, looking at air leaks and talking about adjusting the mask, adjusting the straps, trying to place foam pads, try to do other um, modalities to make it more comfortable but tighter to actually evaluate your pressure points. You have sore eyes, you have dry eyes. Again, you might need a different size mask. We need to adjust the uh, straps. And we, we really have to think about foam pads, which can actually help us uh, a lot, these little foam pads that we put on. If the patient has nasal congestion or discharge, we may need to add humidity. We need to add a filter. We have to adjust the positive pressure settings. If they have nasal airway drying, again, we're gonna do these other types of strategies. We're gonna think about with skin breakdown, we're gonna adjust the mask, we're gonna uh, change the strap tautness, we're gonna think about shifting over to just a nasal mask. And if the front teeth are sensitive, we're gonna adjust our gear, our headgear, because that positive pressure may cause an increased sensitivity. So we're gonna to have to actually promote a little bigger leak. And then of course, with a headgear problem, we're always gonna to try to adjust our headgear, adjust the straps, and we might need to try a larger headgear. So lots of troubleshooting that be, can be done with interfaces to try to make this more comfortable and a better strategy for application. Remember, monitoring, subjective responses, looking at the patient, observing them at the bedside, asking the patient about discomfort. Do they feel like they're breathing better? Do they feel like they're suffocating? Does the mask feel too tight? Do they need a little bit of a release? And then physiologic response. Once I put a patient on a non-invasive strategy, I should see the respiratory rate come down, the heart rate come down if they were tachycardic, the blood pressure come down if they were hypertensive, and it should improve if they were hypotensive. And I'm continuously monitoring the EKG. I wanna see the patient breathing comfortably and in synchrony with the ventilator. I'd like to see less abdominal paradox, less accessory muscle activity, and I'm gonna monitor air leaks and their tidal volumes. So I can look at that on my console, I can see the tidal volume. I monitor air leaks most particularly by putting my hands around the mask and feeling if there's a significant air leak. There will always be a small air leak. 
but if it's a large air leak, they're not going to be able to achieve a tidal volume. And that's, of course, what we're concerned about. Okay. In addition to that, we have to monitor gas exchange. So we'll continuously monitor SpO2, and we'll continuously monitor EKG, at least during the first 12 hours. Remember, we're going to get a blood gas after the first hour to two hours of non-invasive ventilation therapy, and then every one hour after you've made large changes in the settings. After four hours, if I have a patient who is not improving clinically, I now need to consider it's time for intubation. And again, that's a discussion you should have with your team, your respiratory therapist, and your physician colleagues. How long are we going to apply non-invasive ventilation before we make a decision to intubate? It's been my perspective that oftentimes we allow patients to linger on non-invasive ventilation when they are not actually performing well. So we really do need to have a window of time, and at the top of that window, that's the time that's been set to make a decision about whether or not we need elective intubation. Because we never, ever want to have to intubate emergently if we could have prevented it by doing it electively. Okay, when do we determine to discontinue therapy? Okay, so we discontinue therapy for negative reasons for all of the things we've discussed. Your patient can't tolerate it. Their vital signs have deteriorated. They've not improved after two to four hours of non-invasive ventilation. They've gotten confused. They're lethargic. They're obtunded. They're stuporous. They can't handle their secretions. They're having chest pain, dysrhythmia, or they actually have stopped breathing, and all they have is their backup rate. If the pH is getting more acidotic and the PaCO2 is getting higher and they have profound respiratory acidosis associated with this, if their respiratory rate is greater than 30 times per minute, remember hemodynamic instability, if the SpO2 continues to be less than 90%. Now, you may have come to a decision 88% is okay, so that, again, is something you'll discuss with your team. Any decreased level of consciousness, inability to clear secretions, inability to tolerate the interface, we have to discontinue therapy. These are the negative reasons for discontinuation of therapy. But before we say anything about the positive reasons and success, I just want to remind you, you should always have a set time period of evaluation. And if that patient does not have success, that's considered a failure. And now you must consider intubation better early than late. So again, always have a strategy that you've discussed with your team, particularly with the attending physicians, so that if it's off hours and the attending's not there, everyone knows the clarity that after this amount of time, if the patient hasn't been successful, we need to intubate. Okay, so let's remind ourselves. CPAP, positive pressure during spontaneous breaths, BiPAP provides inspiratory pressure and expiratory pressure, so the expiratory pressure is like CPAP. The inspiratory pressure is like pressure support. IPAP controls the peak inspiratory pressure during inspiration. The higher the IPAP, or the wider the difference between IPAP and EPAP, the larger the tidal volume and the bigger the minute ventilation, the better the clearance of CO2. EPAP controls the end expiratory pressure, similar to PEEP, similar to CPAP. EPAP improves oxygenation. It increases the recruitment of your alveoli, so that's actually functional residual capacity, and it relieves upper airway obstruction, so it overcomes the resistance of your upper airways. So if we just take a very quick look at this graphic, and it's a lovely graphic, and all I'm saying to you here is with acute hypercapnia, one of the things that we will often see is auto peep or intrinsic peep. So I'm going to say this very simply, so please forgive me, all physiolog physiologists involved with watching this video. With intrinsic PEEP, unless you applied it with a form of ventilation, intrinsic PEEP is the trapping of dirty gas, meaning CO2 rich, in the lung. We apply CPAP or EPAP to overcome that intrinsic PEEP to actually replace the dirty gas with good gas, meaning CO2 with oxygen, okay? And always reminding ourselves that non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, CPAP particularly, overcomes the intrinsic PEEP, improves your uh, oxygenation, 
replaces the CO2-rich gas with oxygen-rich gas and continues airflow, recruiting your alveoli and maintaining that alveolar constancy of appropriate gas exchange. Hypoxic respiratory failure. We want to remind ourselves that overall, we overcome acute hypoxemic respiratory failure with CPAP, PEEP, and expiratory pressure. And when we want to overcome hypoventilation, we're going to add in IPAP, inspiratory pressure, which actually overcomes airway narrowing, airway occlusion, decreases your work of breathing, and allows you to move more tidal volume. So a non-invasive positive pressure support. We think about CPAP for oxygenation, BiPAP for CO2 clearance and oxygenation. And with both, we're going to consider FiO2. So my conclusions are, I know it's working when I've applied CPAP for hypoxemia because oxygenation improves, but CO2 retention doesn't. I apply BiPAP for hypoxemia and hypercarbia. My CO2 should improve, my work of breathing should improve, and my oxygenation should improve. If I need to make an adjustment, I adjust inspiratory pressure for CO2 and work of breathing. I adjust expiratory pressure and FiO2 for oxygenation. Pretty darn straightforward. These are the basic conclusions. Most important points are, don't put it on patients that are not patients who will respond to this therapy. They need to have a reversible pathology in this instance, for us to use non-invasive ventilatory support. We're gonna aim for gradual improvement over hours with excellent supportive nursing care and respiratory therapy care. We're not expecting you to improve to where we want you to be in two hours. You just need to be on the trajectory to the right direction. So your respiratory rate was 35, now it's 28. Your CO2 was 58, now it's 50 you are responding to non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. And our number one reason is to avoid intubation. Intubation must occur if I cannot treat your alveolar compliance with your EPAP. If I cannot increase IPAP above 20 and you're still having problems with CO2 clearance and your rapid respiratory rate, I'm gonna need to intubate you. So we always hope for success and such as it is with everything, pray for the best, but prepare for the worst. And if the worst happens at four to six hours, it's still hopefully an elective intubation rather than an emergent intubation. Because the main use of non-invasive positive pressure ventilation is to avoid intubation. But guess what? You need to know when to call uncle. I can't make you better with non-invasive ventilation. You can't get with the program, you're so uncomfortable, you're more agitated, or I am not improving oxygenation and CO2 clearance. You need to be intubated. We gave it the college try, but we're calling uncle now. Those are mixed metaphors, but they work really well together. All right, thank you so very much for the basics of non-invasive ventilation. Thank you and see you next time.